Today, I want to talk a little bit about the past and the future of software development, where things are going. When I started development when I was a kid, that meant coming home after school and firing up my Apple IIc, and mostly I would do things like type basic programs. That was what I'd run home after school to go do. Part of the thing that was different about it was I would come home to play with my computer, but there wasn't this sense that computers were going to lead to some big economic success. And I remember my teachers back then, and this was like the late 80s, right? The teachers would sort of be like, well, computers are kind of like being an accountant or somebody in finance or doing data entry. I was really excited when I got a Mac eventually, and I started learning Pascal so I could program that. By the time my late high school, early college years, I was writing Pascal apps, for which were little desktop accessories to start out, and then full software for the Macintosh. And in college, one of my first real programming jobs was working with one of the labs at campus. They had a lot of scientists who had written apps and things like Basic and Fortran, and I would rewrite that in modern Pascal, things like adding in charting options and stuff like that. And it was really fun. Once a week, I would go in and drop off my latest build with a three and a half inch floppy, and that was what being a software developer kind of looked like. When I went to Symantec in 1995, I went to go work in the developer tools group, which was building things like ThinkC and C++. I started that summer, and then that November is when Netscape really started to take things up a notch. People have been talking about browsers for the rest of that year, but that version of Netscape added in both JavaScript and Java, which never confused anybody after that at all. What it meant was that now you could build applications with interactivity for the web, not just documents and things. What that marked was the start of the internet becoming a thing and that hockey stick. Content creation and e-commerce and the 2001 crash and social and a small crash in 2008. The thing is, is that starting in 1995, up until maybe the last six months or a year, there was kind of this sense that tech just kept growing and growing. And at some point it switched over to being kind of like doctor or lawyer. Like your kid, you'd say, tell a kid like, go learn tech and go get a good job. You'll make really good money. Some of the stuff that we learned in the nineties about what tech looked like before all of that may be useful. What I want to cover a little bit is how old stuff is informing what's happening now. First off, one of the big things that was really popular in the late 90s, but kind of vanished, was these drag and drop app builder tools. And there were a lot of them back then. There was uh, one called HyperCard, probably the most famous is Visual Basic, but there were also other ones like Delphi. On the Java side, so starting in 95, people wanted to make a drag and drop builder. I wrote this thing called Cafe Studio, which was probably one of the first Java UI builders for the Mac. Shortly thereafter, there was a Java IDE called Visual Cafe that came out, which is what the Semantic Tools Group worked on. Other apps that were around that same time, like JBuilder. Today, if you go up and you download the NetBeans IDE, you can actually use it to use drag and drop tools to build a swing app. If you've ever wondered why Java has these weird get and set properties, those were actually intended to make the properties available to the visual builder tools, not anything to do with EJBs and all that stuff that came later. Now around that time, there were also a lot of other web development tools. Flash and Dreamweaver were visual drag and drop tools that you could build content for the web. What's interesting is, is somewhere around 2001 to maybe 2004, almost all these visual builders had kind of just gone out of favor. There are a couple of reasons for that. One of them is, is that people just sort of stopped investing in building desktop apps so much because you had the web. So why use a drag and drop builder tool to build desktop apps when it's all about the web? The other one is stuff like WordPress and other content management systems. A lot of the things that people wanted to do early on were really more about publishing content or adding little bits of interactivity to what were fundamentally content sites. The apps that we build, there are a couple of dimensions. One of them is, is it for little companies or big companies? Are they greenfield brand new apps or are they legacy apps that have to support and work with all these existing systems? And that kind of forms this grid that you can, can kind of think of most of the apps that we build. There is a chunk of what to me has always been the most fun and interesting stuff, which is why I think of as the pure tech where the customer is the developer, or maybe it's something very low level. Examples of pure tech to me include things like device drivers or compilers or even IDEs. And there's this one other chunk, which is interestingly big, but 
approaches software development very differently, which is gaming, which is the stuff like Godot and Unreal and Unity and all that kind of stuff. But when we think about what we're doing and what we're building and how software development is going to look going forward, I think that those dimensions give us a way to kind of think about it. So the big money is obviously in the enterprise and the larger scale apps. Some of that's legacy and some of that may be Greenfield, but especially for the legacy side, that might just be a lot of money in things like modernization. This kind of gives the first little taste to me of how things are changing. There's a company locally called TSRI, and what they do is they have a tool that lets you suck up a code base. It uses abstract syntax tree analysis to take that app and target another stack. But they've had a lot of success porting and modernizing things. There's also packages like Open Rewrite that are out now. So a lot of the money that used to be available for modernization, you can now do in ways with much smaller teams by leveraging tools like that. A lot of companies are thinking about what's the smallest staff that I need to maintain the applications? Do they even need to modernize? And one of the things that came up a lot doing consulting even like five, 10 years ago was we'd go in and somebody would have some legacy app and they'd say, well, yeah, we moved it to a VM on the cloud and we're fine. At the other end, you have the smaller companies or greenfield projects. And this is the one that really caught my eye even a few years ago. When I would go to the forums on places like Reddit that were focusing on entrepreneurship, a lot of them were using a very different set of tools. And in many ways, those tools look a lot more like the kinds of tools that I saw in the late 90s. They were these drag and drop builder UI tools. A couple of the names that kept coming up were things like Bubble, Flutterflow, and BuildShip. Let's just take a few minutes to look at Bubble. You can build a lot of different kinds of web apps, use a drag and drop tool. There's an integrated data repository. So you don't actually have to set up a separate database and everything. The underlying structure is based on top of a Postgres database instance. It also lets you talk to REST services. So if you want to keep all of your secret sauce in a Java or C Sharp or whatever REST service, you can do all that and then just expose the UI through Bubble. Part of what makes Bubble cool is it has this giant marketplace. If you're a senior developer, you might say, hey, I'm going to build a plugin and make that available through something like Bubble. If you're a traditional Java or C Sharp developer or some other server side stack, you might look at Bubble and say, eh, I don't get what the deal is. But you got to remember, if I can plug in my REST services and then I can use something like that to handle all the UI UX, I can move a lot faster. And if I don't want to use the Bubble data store, I could use something like Supabase, which will give me a hosted Postgres database with OAuth and identity and all that stuff in a few clicks. Now I've got a complete Postgres database backend and a drag and drop UI builder that works great for the web. And it does responsive and mobile and all that fun stuff. Now you might look at some of the price points and say, oh, well, that looks expensive. The trick is, is that if you're talking about doing a startup or for a company and you can replace even one headcount by doing these kinds of tools, it's a complete no brainer. It's fast. It's easy to update. The tools support things like team development and collaboration, branching, backups, all that fun stuff. It's, it's there. If you're a startup, you can just focus on building the cool, unique thing that you're trying to do. And in some cases, like if it's something like a marketplace or something like that, maybe you can just literally build everything on top of something like Bubble. You might say, hey, I want to do more backend stuff, in which case you might want to check out something like BuildShip, which is drag and drop tooling to handle the backend. Or you might say, oh, I really want to build a mobile app, in which case you might want to look at something like Flutterflow, which is basically a drag and drop builder for Flutter. Every one of these packages has the option to bag out to write your own custom stuff. That could actually be a cool opportunity if you're a developer, build plugins and drop them into the marketplaces. Another thing you might say, hey, I don't want to use Bubble because I only want to use things that I own. So here's another list of Bubble competitors, AppSmith, BuddyBase, Retool, Tooljet, Airtable, and there's so many more than I could count. And many of those, if not all of them, offer open source packages. And in many cases, they have Kubernetes builds with Docker deployment info and all that fun stuff. So if you want to host your own, do self-host. A lot of them just have, this is how you do it. Now you're getting to where a custom app looks more like something where you've installed a drag and drop tool on some internal systems or publicly exposed, or you're using a partner site to manage it. If you do need to write custom code, that's where stuff like LLMs comes in because almost all of these tools are adding in extra little features to 
will let you drop in that little tiny extra bit of scripting that you need. If you need more, then maybe it's a plugin. And this is the thing. Once you start getting used to being able to just drag and drop and build a UI, you don't want to go backwards. Once you've been used to using an off-the-shelf UI builder tool just to make your website, you don't really want to go back to hand coding everything. This gets into this really sort of awkward and at times almost emotional thing. I've been doing Java since 1995. I like writing code by hand. I, I do. And I remember looking at people who insisted on writing web services in C or C++. And there was this brief period there where that's what people were trying to do. And then the whole server would crash with one bug. I was a Java developer. I'd say, oh, it's so much easier and better to just build a Java app instead. Well, now it's the people who are using a tool like Bubble who look at me as a Java developer and say, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing all this stuff by hand? This is crazy. More recently, I've been building apps with a Svelte kit and TypeScript, and I really like it. It's fun. It's so much faster and easier, especially for building like everything from desktop apps to mobile apps to what have you. But even there, I built a project recently with Svelte kit and TypeScript, and then I went back to try knocking it out in Bubble, and it took like a fraction of the time. Here's the thing. If you're a skeptical developer and you're listening to this, what I would suggest is take an hour and just go through the tutorials, build a to-do list app, and then maybe, you know, make it responsive, add some plugins, have it talk to a REST service, and just think about how long it took you to do that versus doing it all by hand. When I do that, I find it's fast, it's easy. In some ways it's fun and clearly it's way cheaper. Make changes really fast and all that stuff. But there is this missing piece. And I think for me that comes back to this sense of craft. And what I mean by that is like this maker mindset that you get when you make something yourself. The shelves right behind me right now, those were built by my great grandfather by hand. They've been around my whole life. They weren't just something that came from, you know, Ikea or whatever. So I have a little bit more of an emotional connection to it. And that emotional connection, I think is true even with the code that we write. And this is where I start feeling like a shoemaker, where it's like, I like to craft shoes by hand, but every day I turn on the news and I see more and more shoe factories. I don't know what's going to happen over the next few years, obviously, but I do kind of feel like the writing is on the wall for at least a good chunk of this stuff. It's not the software development's going to go away, but it is going to change. In some ways, it feels almost like old mainframe. How much of the work do you already spend today logging into cloud development environments as opposed to writing code by hand? I do think that we're very close to seeing something like a hyper card for the web built on top of the premise that you're using things like an LLM to describe the requirements and then it'll translate it to, to some kind of development stack underneath the covers. My bet would be probably something TypeScript based. Users will be able to sit down, say what they want, modify it with some combination of drag and drop tools and some of this LLM stuff. There is an economic component of this. If I'm a business manager and I have a choice between building everything by hand with custom development, or I can use a drag and drop tool and then just get one person maybe as contract to build the plugin that I need, what am I going to do? This may lead to a new split in how we talk about software development. Back in the old days, there were application developers writing things in like basic or Fortran or whatever. And then there were the system programs who might write things in C and assembly. We might see this small, intense market for core developers, people that could do Rust and handle all the cloud configuration for all the backend, for all the complicated things. And maybe they work on compilers and game engines or whatever, that low level stuff. And then you'll just see this more and more more of a sea of drag and drop developers. The pay gap will probably be pretty significant. The drag and drop developers might look more like the accountant and the core people may still maintain those high end salaries, but the bar to get in there is going to be really high. And you know, what's really fascinating to me about that is that's almost exactly like what the counselors and the teachers said to me in the late eighties around why be a developer. You're going to be more like an accountant. In this really strange way, it almost feels at times like the entire software industry happened in this blip of an eye where it went from nothing to the internet and exploding and being this huge thing to now, you know, between this combination of drag and drop tools and LLM based stuff to support it and all that just look totally different. I mean, we already see how much of the time and energy gets put into cloud stuff. Let me know what you think. I know this may seem like a hot take. To me, it doesn't feel that crazy. It feels more just like I'm reading the 
what's going on in the news every day. But I'm curious to see what you think. Do you like the idea of using web-based drag and drop builders for building a lot of your UI? If you think any of this is interesting, go ahead and hit like and subscribe and all that fun stuff. And then the other one is in the comments. One of my favorite things to do is to go through the comments. Take care. Hope you guys are doing all right.